never know where research is going to take you. I began my scientific career studying the origin of life, and now I work on cellular aging and how to extend lifespan. And tonight, I'm going to share with you my journey as a scientist of how discovery happens. So when I was a first year PhD student, I knew that I wanted to do myomedical research, but I really had no idea where my passion or my interests lie. When I was interviewing with prospective supervisors, I was introduced to this concept of a molecule called a catalytic RNA molecule. And the person who introduced this concept to me eventually became my PhD advisor. So I was intrigued by this, but I really had no idea why it was important or what it actually meant. Luckily, in the program I was in as a graduate student, we got to do eight-week rotations in a lab to see if we liked it, to see if we liked the research and liked the environment. So I took this opportunity to learn more about this research and ultimately ended up deciding to do my PhD with this professor. So why is this important and why did I find this interesting? We're taught as undergraduate students, and probably now in high school, something called the central dogma of molecular biology. And this is DNA makes RNA makes proteins. Now, we've just heard that DNA carries all of our genetic information and why it's so critical. We're taught at this point in time that RNA is an exact replica of the DNA and that that information stored in the RNA can then go on and make protein. So now we have DNA in the cell that's critical for genetic information and protein in the cell that is made in some ways to catalyze biochemical reactions. And it was always thought for a very long time, RNA was just there to shuttle the information between the DNA and the protein. However, with this idea of catalytic RNA molecules, it kind of changed the focus of this linear progression of DNA makes RNA makes proteins. And now we had a molecule in the center of this that no longer simply just carried genetic information, but could also catalyze biochemical reactions. And at the time, this was such a new concept and essentially unheard of because most enzymes in the cell were proteins. So how on earth could we possibly have an RNA molecule that could catalyze a biochemical reaction? In addition to its interest from a biochemical point of view, it also provided a link between this biological question of which came first, the chicken or the egg. Translated into biology, that meant how could we make DNA without the protein enzymes that was needed to replicate it, but how could we get proteins without the DNA genes that encode for them? And that's where these catalytic RNA molecules came into play because it could act both as a carrier of genetic information and as a biocatalyst. So this completely fascinated me. And I spent the next four years working on this small RNA molecule, trying to figure out how it folded into a specific structure and how that structure allowed it to perform a very simple yet critical biochemical reaction. And this was really intriguing. And this led us to believe, and research in this field led us to this RNA world hypothesis, by which RNA may have been the first molecule of life in that it had genetic information and could create biochemical reactions. And in this whole primordial soup of evolution, this might have been the ancestral molecule. So that was really interesting, and that was great for four years. But after that, you start getting a little bit bored and you start looking for the next big question. And at this point in time, I really didn't know what I wanted to do or even if I wanted to continue in academic research. But luckily, my supervisor sent me to a meeting, a conference, where the keynote speaker was given by a woman by the name of Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn. And again, I got excited about science. Elizabeth Blackburn worked on an enzyme called telomerase. And I don't know if any of you have heard of that, and I hadn't at the time, but what she described to me, I found incredibly fascinating. So why was I so interested and why did I get excited about science again? Well, telomerase is a molecule that catalyzes an enzymatic reaction 
But rather than just being in the cell and containing protein, it also contained an RNA molecule. So I was really intrigued by why in modern cellular processes, where proteins are mostly, en or enzymes are mostly proteins, why would a cell evolve to have an enzyme carry around with it an RNA component as well? The other thing that really intrigued me about this enzyme was it added another level of complexity to this central dogma of molecular biology, in that this enzyme actually made DNA from RNA. So not only was it really interesting from a biochemical reaction, telomerase might have actually been a cellular modern day relic of the RNA world I was so interested in as a graduate student because we now had a mechanism by which DNA could be made from RNA in the presence of a protein molecule. So what exactly is telomerase and why is it important in the cell? DNA is a very critical component in the cell as it needs to be maintained because it contains all of our genetic information. However, the chromosomes in our cells are linear. And the very, very ends of our chromosomes are called telomeres, and they really consist of very repetitive DNA sequence that really don't encode for any genes. But what they do is confer stability on the ends of these linear chromosomes. By the nature by which DNA replicates, every time a cell divides, those telomeres get shorter and shorter and shorter. And it's the telomerase enzyme that comes in and adds DNA to the ends of these telomeres to ensure that the DNA is not lost on the chromosome. So luckily at this point in time, I had a colleague who was working down the hall from me who just got an independent position at the Amgen Institute in Toronto. And she offered me an opportunity to do postdoctoral work with her to study this enzyme telomerase. So I was a little bit iffy about doing such a critical part of my training with a new investigator, but I decided to take a chance, and I had a great postdoctoral training experience during the next three years. So while I've explained to you that the role of telomerase in the cell is very important, when I started out studying this enzyme, I really didn't care much about what it did in the cell. What I was really interested in is how it came together as an enzyme to perform a function in a test tube. So I developed this system whereby I looked at how the RNA component and the protein component came together to catalyze this reaction. So I chopped up the protein, I chopped up the RNA, I mixed them together in the test tube, I looked at what regions of the RNA were important for function, what regions of the protein were important for function, and I was quite satisfied with my research at that point in time. When I got my independent position here at the University of Calgary, I extended that a little bit further and asked not just how do they function together, but also how do they interact with telomeric DNA. And that was all well and good. And we got a ton of information about how this enzyme functioned biochemically. But again, after a few years, you start thinking a little bit more and a little bit further. And I wasn't satisfied with just understanding how this enzyme worked in a test tube. I really wanted to know what the implications for telomerase were in a cell and what that actually meant in a cell if you had too much telomerase or didn't have enough telomerase. As I mentioned, telomerase acts at the very ends of your chromosome to add telomeric sequence. However, not all cells possess telomerase. And in those cells that don't have telomerase, as cells continue to divide, telomeres get shorter and shorter and shorter. And eventually, they're going to hit what we call a critically short state. At this point in time, your DNA becomes genetically unstable and cells stop dividing. This is actually known as a molecular clock that actually can count the number of cell divisions and is a part of the aging process. Alternatively, there are some cells in your body that do have telomerase, and with the ability to add these telomere sequences onto the ends of your chromosomes, telomeres won't get shorter and shorter and shorter, and your cells can continue to divide. So I know that this sounds like a lot of jargon, but let me show you this in a very nice pictorial manner. What we want is to think about our chromosomes as shoelaces 
and our telomeres as little aglets at the end of your shoelace. So you get a brand new pair of shoes and you have a nice intact shoelace with an aglet and you can do up your sneakers really, really well. The shoelaces are long enough, you can tie them up and you can go on your way. However, if the shoes get old or the cell gets old and the aglet starts to fray, you can no longer have it cap or end your shoelace and it makes it a lot tougher to do up your sneakers. If for some reason that shoelace gets cut while you're outside running or playing, it's no longer long enough to actually do up your shoe. And this is actually what we're looking at when we look at cellular aging. Now, I've just told you that if you have telomerase in a cell, you can stop the telomeres from shortening. So why don't we just take a whole bunch of telomerase and add it to some cells and then just extend our lifespan? Well, with like everything else in biology, it's never quite that simple. So it's very, very critical for a cell if it's supposed to have telomerase to have the right amount. And if it's not supposed to have telomerase, adding too much will also be detrimental. So one key issue in our research in aging and cancer is how the cell actually finds the balance between too much telomerase, which has been associated with a number of different cancers, and too little telomerase that has been associated with many premature aging syndromes. At this point in time, I was really interested in how the cell ages. And so I decided to shift the focus of the research in my lab, and we started looking at cellular aging. And what better way to study a process than to study what happens when that process goes wrong? And how does this relate to health? Well, actually, telomere length is a really good biomarker for disease. And what I have shown on the graph up here is a plot of telomere length on the y-axis and age on the x-axis. And what you see with the lines is the normal distribution of telomeres amongst the population. And what is shown at the bottom is a number of premature aging syndromes where patients have considerably short telomeres compared to their age match controls. What I was really interested in is why do these patients have shorter telomeres? So we knew if you added telomerase back into a cell, you could elongate their telomeres. And I wanted to know if telomerase played a role or if telomerase deficiency played a role in these premature aging phenotypes. So I scoured the literature and tried to find out what was already published on these syndromes. And what I found was that other researchers, clinical researchers, had already identified mutations in telomerase genes based on genomic sequencing to show that there was a strong correlation between the presence of mutations in the telomerase genes and these premature aging syndromes. But I wanted to understand how those mutations resulted in telomere shortening. So our lab developed a cell culture model, and we were able to characterize some of the biochemical properties and the cellular properties of these mutations in the cell. And what we actually found was, like in the patients, the telomeres were shorter in our cell culture model. So what does that mean? Well, it actually means that the cell thinks, or it's behaving as if it has no or very little telomerase activity in them. So what we're trying to do now is delve deeper using this cell culture model to understand the exact mechanisms and the cellular implications for these short telomeres so we can better understand these aging phenotypes so we can better understand the process of cellular aging. The idea being, if we can understand how to turn telomerase back on in these cells, Perhaps we can stop the premature aging and we can extend the lifespan and essentially reduce the incidence of these diseases. So you have heard a lot about creating the future of health and precision medicine. So how does any of this fit in with the goals of the Cummings School of Medicine? Well, we have just begun a collaboration with one of my clinical colleagues to look at familial incidence of a syndrome called myodysplastic syndrome, or MDS. And MDS 
is a bone marrow um, syndrome that predisposes patients to developing leukemia or other blood cancers. Now, what we know based on the population is that many patients with MDS have shorter telomeres. However, we don't know if those short telomeres are predictive to go on to develop a cancer. So we have a really powerful set of patient samples, all from the same family, to actually start dissecting what the relationship is between telomeres, telomerase, and the onset of malignancy. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take these patient samples and do genomic sequencing on them to try to find mutations in telomerase genes and hopefully mutations in other genes that we can identify that can synergize together for disease progression. Again, with the idea of understanding how disease progresses if we can actually stop that transformation. Understanding telomere length and telomerase activity can also inform patient care in that knowing something about these can actually help us make the decisions or help my clinical colleagues make the decisions about whether to give a bone marrow transplant and whether or not a family member would be a viable donor or whether or not that family member might share the same mutations as an affected sibling. That's essentially my story. My lab is still actively working on the aging process and understanding cellular lifespan. But this is how I have gone from working on the origin of life to understanding the aging process. So what I want you to take home from this is you never know where curiosity is going to take you. I have had an incredibly fortunate opportunity as a scientist to follow my passion and follow my interests. And letting scientists be scientists will lead to discovery and you never know how that will eventually impact our society. Thank you.